Welcome to another episode of the Corporate Cowboys Podcast. I'm your host, Alex. This episode, like all episodes, is powered by Incorporating Associates. We're continuing on with uh, part 10 of this audiobook, where we read chapter 9 of the book Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. The authors are Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. The publisher is Productivity Press, 2022. The title of chapter nine is Unsticking the Future. And I'll, I'll jump right into it. Of course, there are always a couple of quotes in the very beginning. I actually have grown to like these quotes. They're somewhat thought provoking and uh, they provide later on, they provide some, some additional context some additional themes that can be tied into uh, the material we read. The first one is by Holly Black. That's changing is what people do when they have no options left. I like that. Changing is what people do when they have no options left. Okay. And the second one is, and here I sit so patiently waiting to find out what price you have to pay to get out of going through all these things twice. Oh, mama, is this really the end? To be stuck inside of Mobile with the Memphis Blues again. And that quote was by Bob Dylan. Essentially, it's uh, it's really just making, not making light, but shedding light on the chapter title, Unsticking the Future, where... If you've gone through things once, fearing that you'll go through them again is akin to remaining stuck and having the future repeat itself due to a lack of change, a lack of adjustment, a lack of personal evaluation, intra, introspection, if you will. So, onward. It begins with Tim. Tim is a part of a team that designed a new technology. It is a lightweight suit you wear that helps improve your ability to lift extremely heavy objects called an exoskeleton. The suit offsets part of the load to make lifting and bending tasks easier and safer. These tasks hold great promise for warehouses and facilities, machinery and repair roles, including military operations and even health situations where there is a long-term muscular degeneration, where there is long-term muscular degeneration. A powered exoskeleton can allow an average worker to lift over 200 pounds above their head, which means a worker in a warehouse can easily move around most products without the help of a forklift, and they can be as small as a backpack. It is also big business for the market of exoskeleton suits, estimated to reach 2.1 billion by 2026. Damn, 2026? I might just pick one of these up, man. A large box store approached Tim's team and asked if it would be possible to develop a device that could keep their workers that could keep their workers be safer while making the job easier and more efficient. More than likely, uh, and again, just a side commentary, at times I will read over a grammatical or typographical error and I may try to adjust it, uh, revise it in real time. Sometimes I don't catch it. Sometimes it'll trip me up. Sometimes it will even trip me up, uh, which, I mean, this entire episode and the entire podcast really is is geared toward my professional development, my, my social development as a professional and being able to read aloud, pronounce and enunciate. I've repeated this time and time again. This serves as a personal form of professional therapy and it is very much cathartic at the same time because I can say damn near whatever it is I want so long as I'm not breaking certain rules, let's let's say. Uh, So this large box store approached Tim's team and asked if it would be possible to develop a device that that could keep their workers safer while making the job easier and more efficient, better help their workers be safer. 
but I, I like keep their workers safer only because it, it eliminates the word must add more while making the job easier and more efficient tim and the team developed an exoskeleton to do just that make the job easier and safer the store loved the product but then came the rollout the store wanted to hype it up the marketing team the marketing team came up with the plan to roll out the suit using a comic book that played up the superhuman strength their warehouse team would get from the suit like iron man Tim hears the Iron Man comparison all the time. The concept is right, but they will just be disappointed if that's what they get in their head. They really just need to feel it to understand. That's, that's Tim's quote. Uh, they used the approach in two stores, and in two stores, the staff was underwhelmed. Some workers used the suits while others did not. They asked the workers, in quotes, why didn't, why didn't use... Who, who didn't use the suits and why? That was me fucking up, sorry. They asked the workers, in quotes, who didn't use the suits and why? The workers responded that they didn't want to be the center of attention or that they were, quote unquote, strong enough and did not need, quote unquote, help to do their job. The suits sat unused and the team was disappointed. Then Tim had a different idea. Instead of hyping the suits, what if he undersold the suits? What if he just called them tools that fit like backpacks? Tim explained, if you can wear a backpack, you can use our exoskeleton. Tim tried this approach and it worked. The same workers who were initially reluctant became users by trying out the backpack. Over the next few months, the company changed their entire approach to adoption. Instead of telling people, they showed them. Instead of videos, they put backpacks on the people. No more comic book comparisons. It was real world experiences. No more superheroes, just super strength, safety, and sales. Just a side comment. Yeah, absolutely. It's better to uh, under promise and over deliver than to over promise, like in this case, fucking comic book characters. I mean, for full grown adults to even believe that they would become Iron Man with the backpack is fucking concerning. But at the same time, best practice, best practice is going to be to under promise and over deliver. That creates positive rapport, that develops into reputation, that, that becomes a reputation. Tim's story is common. It says here, Tim's story is common. A disruptive technology trying to connect with the market in the right place, sorry, in the right way at the right time. He believed he had the right solution for a real problem and he may be right. But if no one ever tried it, he would never know. The difference between a good idea and a great product is often adoption. And the difference between adoption and resistance often comes down to the ability of the product to overcome the intuitive brain of the customer, the employee or leader. Often they are stuck. Organizations today face much more than a simple decision about one solution. Each leader faces the challenges of multiple new technologies coming at them every day. Each new technology promises to revolutionize their business with efficiency and effectiveness never seen before. Add to the challenge that the demands of the workplace are shifting too. Our retiring workforce and our emerging workforce have very different needs with the new entrants seeking a type of social activism that requires leadership to rethink organizational engagement. Often, all, all of this against the backdrop of a once in a century global pandemic that will change the way we work forever. Where will this take us? This chapter will explore how do we unstick digital transformation, automation, or analytics? How do we avoid getting stuck in the post-pandemic world? How do we manage our multi-generational and diverse workforce with the right stickiness? And how do we avoid burnout without getting stuck? Lastly, what are five key takeaways for individuals, for leaders, and for organizations who are stuck? Our constantly changing technology. That's the next section here. 
As much as we talk about a technology-driven economy, technological investments depend on people. The history of our global economy demonstrate a gradual demonstrates demonstrates our history of a global our history. See, I'm fucking that up. The history, the history of our global economy demonstrates a gradual process where we find a balance between people and technology to create greater value as technology emerges to slowly improve the work of people. In each successive wave of economic evolution, we find that new technological solutions emerge, people slowly adopt, and organizations slowly adopt. While there is a trend over time that technology does have a displacement impact on certain roles in the economy, it is never as imminent nor as widespread as it may seem at the start of the new trend. With the agrarian society, new techniques and large farming equipment slowly came to replace the individual farmer. Machines were introduced and gradually replaced many elements of the manufacturing supply chain. However, as the exoskeletons example shows above, machines have not replaced all parts of the supply chain. Emerging technology still looks to disrupt last last mile delivery. Uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, yeah, I think that's I think that's worded right. Emerging technology still looks to disrupt last mile delivery and the stocking of products. Many service jobs like call centers may be digitized over time, but higher order service jobs like doctors and advisors cannot be disrupted, and knowledge economy roles are the natural next step for those workers in the service economy. Now, as we sit in the interaction economy, trends like digital transformation, increased automation, and data analytics again seem to threaten the human's role in economic production. But this change will not happen overnight. It will not be a clean cut to new technology. We will be in a state of transition for some time where humans and new forms of technology will need to collaborate for years to come. However, this transition period of technology and human integration will require humans to adopt and use new forms of technology. Digitally transforming people. That's the next section. Digital transformation is the use of technology to strategically redesign the work of an organization. Often, organizations believe that digital transformation is the purchase of a new software or platform to manage a portion or all of their business but that is simply not the case. It is a holistic redesign of the business around a solution. Even the most robust platforms today, Salesforce, Workday, SAP, SAP, require significant process changes from the workforce to have a successful implementation. This simple difference in perspective immediately reveals the importance of people in digital transformation. There is simply no way to realize the value of a digital transformation without bringing people along for the journey. Gerald Kane describes this as the technology fallacy. The technology fallacy is the mistaken notion that because business challenges are caused by digital technologies, the solutions are also going to lie in digital technologies. That's in quotes. The fact is that it is, the fact is that is, what? The fact is that it is your, yeah. The fact is that it is your people who will fuel or thwart your digital transformation. And through an extensive research program with surveys of 4,800 executives, managers, and employees around the world over five years, Kane found we are not ready. Only 44% of the more than 16,000 respondents in this study confirmed their company is prepared for shifts in technology. The primary reason is that the shift is the technology fallacy. We need people to adopt before we are going to have a fully digital world 
and our people are not ready for this kind of change. So most digital transformations will be slow. To be clear, this is not a comment on the value of the solution or even the sales of the platforms. The platforms will sell. Leaders will buy them and try to implement them, but full value and true digital transformation will struggle without a complete understanding of the human side of the equation. Until organizations and leaders recognize the technology fallacy, digital transformation as a people-centered solution, the adoptions of such solutions will struggle. The next section is augmented with automation. The same is true with automation. Automation techniques like robotic process automation, that's RPA, and ultimately artificial intelligence, AI, require humans. Many view these solutions as displacement strategies, but in reality, these solutions will spend many years working alongside humans to support the work of humans before these technologies will work autonomously from humans. Jason Kingdon, CEO of RPA leader Blue Prism, describes how the pandemic shined a light on the gaps existing between human workers and automation. Kingdon likes to pitch companies about half of all tasks for a digital worker, that's workers in the service or knowledge economy, can be accomplished by machines. The question remains whether machines can create the value that humans create in workflow through complex thought. These tasks should not be automated. Instead, automation should support workers in their tasks to be able to do more thinking and problem solving toward more effective complex thought. In a recent study of 1,300 CIOs, I would imagine chief information officers and technology leaders, only 12% noted that they were using AI to replace workers. Fully 60% described their organization as using the technology as a platform to assist the workforce. Process automation will replace some jobs and humans will be augmented by automation to create more value. Moreover, this support should liberate the mind for greater work. Research in this field supports Kingdon's belief as short-term unemployment driven by automation is expected to be significantly offset by the job creation enabled by upmarket thinking and automation. People will not become less important in work. They will become more important for doing the work that only humans can do. The work cannot be captured or replicated by the logic of the rational brain. People will become important in the workplace, in fact, celebrated for their intuitive brain. The brain that leads with emotional caring of others, creates memories for the organizations, and develops shared learning among the organizations cannot be automated. This is true. This is true. I mean, in order to have, in order to, to keep organizations alive, you need something like the lifeblood and the lifeblood of any organization to date. This is just a side commentary. The lifeblood of any organization to date remains people, whether they be on the supply side, inside of the organization, serving the public, serving the customer, or on the demand side, the actual customer, the client, the patron. And to do that, well, you need actual people. I mean, you, you can't automate you can't automate all of supply, just like you cannot automate all of demand. You must have some interaction, and that interaction is so nuanced. It's human. It's literally human. Literally. The next section here is empowered with data. Data is a slightly different but mostly similar story. A 2018 Forbes article demonstrates the true abundance and overwhelming growth of data. With nearly 4 billion humans on the planet using the internet daily, the proliferation of an internet of things with more devices using the internet, social media that generates more images, sounds, and videos, and digital services we depend on daily, we can expect our data to continue to grow. Large businesses that harness data and leverage it 
for decision making will continue to succeed in the economy, while those that struggle with data will likely fail. However, despite the understanding for the volume and breadth of data, many organizations struggle with how to use the data. Leaders feel challenged to make decisions based on the data in front of them instead of based on years of expertise, quote unquote. Like Grady, they're talking about Victoria Grady. Or actually, no, they're not talking about Victoria Grady. Uh, Grady, like Grady, in our opening story from the film Moneyball, many leaders, and, and they're talking about the opening story from like part two of this audiobook. That's chapter one. Go look at chapter one. It's literally stuck, part two. Like Grady in our opening story from the film Moneyball, many leaders feel that their industry doesn't work based on data. It works on feel, instinct, gut. The question is, why is it one or the other? In so many organizations, data volume is high and understanding of data is low. It will be a long time before anyone will trust data alone to make decisions. However, data informed decisions with data inf informed leaders can start now. Thomas Davenport offers practical advice for leaders looking to bridge the gap. He notes that leaders can make themselves the consumers of data, learn a little bit, learn a little about analytics, ask hard questions, and create an inquisitive culture that will support data-informed decisions in an organization without data being the sole driver, without data being the sole driver of decisions. In this way, data and people will work together to answer organizational questions. Notice how I had to repeat that without data being the sole driver of decisions. <laughs> if you want, if you want some, some more insight on why I had to repeat that, I suggest, I, I insist, I insist you go listen to uh, the podcast season i believe it was season one season one episode two or episode three from the first fucking season man from the first season uh the title of which is i'll pull it up for you right now uh episode one episode one no uh season one episode two episode two the second episode i always I think I've made as many references to episode one as I have to episode two over the course over the course of this podcast, and uh, season one episode two is uh, I think a, a great example of the, the title of which is called Big Data, Just a Tiny Problem. So you can have big data, and you'll always have that tiny problem, and the tiny problem is again human in nature, because when you have big data and you're informing it then with human values with uh with human morality you essentially run the risk of the data becoming compromised the data being compromised and i go into it in depth that's season one episode two check it out this next section is unsticking technology Many leading organizations will feel an imperative to invest in digital transformation, automation, and data. There really isn't a choice for the elite companies anymore. The question is not when humans will get on board with the technologies, but how. Our lessons and attachments become instructive in helping us work through these cases. Experience the change. We know that Attachment emerges in the limbic system where memory, emotions, and learning come together. This means that effective change is better experienced than, than, than discussed. It says here that, that discussed, but I would imagine is better experienced than discussed. The conversation alone will lead the individual to go to their own memories of similar experiences and the associated emotions. To reshape those memories around new technologies, leaders must help users experience the change that is coming. With most technology solutions, this means giving them a type or prototype that they can see. 
The more tailored, the better. The more advanced, the better. The more the user can see themselves and their work in the solution, the more likely they are willing to use the solution for their own work. The more likely they are to adopt. I fucked up that last sentence. It's really the more likely they will adopt. The more likely they will adopt. The more likely they will adopt. Live in the transition. In all three of these cases, there is a transitional period from the mostly human way of living to the mostly technology-driven future we believe is coming. As a result, we are clearly in a transitional space with relation to technology. While we emphasized the importance of the transitional space for driving change, it is also a critical place for creativity and play. Leaders should encourage their teams to be creative with new technology solutions, to play with new tools, and develop innovative solutions that yield new value for the organization. Practically, this means creating opportunities for co-creation, co-creation and solution making among team members with the new platforms and technology to encourage play as a way of engagement. Tech serves us. Since technology serves humans and not the other way around, the messaging, I mean, not yet, right? <laughs> Since technology serves humans and not the other way around, the messaging of technological transformation needs to remind people how technology serves them. How will it make their lives easier? To play on the old familiar quote from President Kennedy, Leaders need to ask not what employees, this is in quotes, ask not what employees will do for technology, but what technology will do for the team. Yeah, I mean, I think that's aptly worded. I, I like that. A simple turn of phrase that will remind the organization where the priorities reside. Moreover, technology should create connection and bring disparate groups of the organization together to collaborate. It should not create haves and have nots or differences among the organization. Evolve tech emotionally, not necessarily logically. Organizations must move slowly through new technology adoption up a maturity curve from a known current emotional state through a transition space to a future state trying to i mean if you're if you're lost on 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 what that sentence just was <laughs> up a maturity curve known as the current emotional state tr through a transition space to a future state go look at i believe is i believe it was um I believe it was chapter five. What do I get stuck to? I believe it was chapter five or chapter six. How does culture get stuck? Shit, it could have been chapter four. I suggest you, you go uh, revisit a couple of these parts. <laughs> <laughs> trying to jump people, trying to jump people from the known emotional present to the unknown with illogical leaps can hurt the brain and will only yield resistance. Bitcoin, social media, and a privacy all demonstrate the same lesson here. On Bitcoin, many Americans do not touch paper money daily. So why are younger people most likely to adopt Bitcoin? Because they grew up in a world of not touching paper money. They have memories of money that is almost entirely connected to an electronic platform. As a result, the mental leap to an algorithm as the basic trust mechanism and backing for the currency is not a difficult logical leap. The same is true of each progressive social media platform. When you are familiar with sharing a story, a picture makes sense, and then a video. And while some are greatly concerned with privacy, others freely give the privacy away in exchange for both access to content and the valued social clout. Fucking clout chasers. The brain makes the journey, and if the brain has the memories, emotions, and learning that support the logical next step in advancement, then it is easier to make that step. If not, 
then an easier former object may be the safer place for the brain to attach. The next section here is our evolving workplace. As we concluded in our discussion on technology in the workplace, it is not about technology, but about people. We need to make our organizations more human. So what's happening with people? Quite a lot. We have five generations working simultaneously. We have just had a global pandemic. There is a global crisis of burnout. There are social issues that previously quiet companies must address. Our workforce is changing and evolving against the backdrop of efficiency pressures that emerge from the technology fallacy. Due to this trend, too many leaders believe that investments in technology should yield immediate efficiency outcomes. Yeah, I mean, that's a fucking misconception. The result is that people need to make up the gap by stretching and overworking. What happens when one more change comes along? Is our brain ready for it? Nope, it's stuck. The generational gaps. Over the last decade, the American workforce has been undergoing a significant evolution. It started with the great financial crisis. As a result of losses in the housing and financial markets, many baby boomers and some in the silent generation, many, ba many baby boomers and some in the silent generation decided, this is an extra word here, decided to delay retirement. Next the oversized millennial generation started to move up the ranks in organizations and became leaders across industries. Millennials, leaders, wild. But, I mean, I'm going to find out it is necessarily true, especially with the uh, pr proliferation and promulgation and promotion of diversity in the workplace. But, um, you know, that's neither here nor there. And when you got... Uh, when you got a uh, liberal soaked millennials coming out of you know getting MBAs and whatnot, they're gonna pander to whatever sells in the market. So of course, if they're informed by by views on social justice, then their actions when they move into positions of leadership will necessarily be dictated not so much by the market but exactly by profit motive. They can, if they can squeeze the market on, on unrealistic virtue, on fictional virtue, they will. They absolutely will. I mean, you're, you're listening to a cutthroat motherfucker say that he would, so you know, other, you know others would. Say that he could. I could, but I choose not to because at the end of the day, I believe that to be fuckery and not conducive to becoming, to being a consummate professional. Third, Generation Z started to join the workforce in mass. These trends have collectively led to five generations in the workplace and five generations governing wealth. I fucking doubt that. Governing wealth, the millennials barely get a taste of it. The millennials, and I'm, and I'm, part, I'm in that category, but the millennials are, are, are cutthroat. We're not necessarily stacking wealth. We're touching it. Oh yeah, we're touching it. But as far as governing it goes, nah, we're, we're slowly but surely wedging and, and shimming our way into a position to govern those that govern the wealth. That's some corporate cowboy shit. Keep up, keep up, pay attention. For example, there is a 72-year age gap between the world's oldest working billionaire, Warren Buffett, and the youngest working billionaire, Kevin David Lehman. <coughs> cool names. This age range in the workforce creates a shift in expectations. In their 80-year review of the Gallup workforce data, Jim Clifton and Jim Harder found a marked shift in the way workers are thinking about their roles. People continue to move away from an emphasis on their paycheck to an emphasis on purpose, from a desire for simple satisfaction to continued development. 
and from simply a job to a holistic view on their life. The impact, yeah, that sounds, that's some corporate cowboy shit right there. And a lot of people are waking up to this in all five of those generations. Mostly, mostly because a lot of the younger people grew up with technology in their hands. They see how easy it is to do things. And so these younger people from like millennials down, maybe even from generation X down, they're still jockeying for positions to get into positions and, and negotiate themselves into positions of uh, influence, of power. And it might be for to, to better themselves and better the world or, just, or only to benefit themselves. You know, it's, um, it's, it, 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 it's, I want to say corporate cowboy adjacent. So they are taking on a lot of uh, the values of a corporate cowboy, but some of them may, might still be misinformed especially if uh, they came up observing the wrong, I don't know, not ideologies, but the wrong methodologies. Because if you view, a, if you view the world through a lens of natural order, then logic intact necessarily dictates what is right and what is wrong. But, you know, there are those subversive types that find a way, find a way or, or force a way to make things work in their favor so that they profit or, or they benefit or they're able to take advantage of not, not a weakness or a vulnerability, but, uh, but of, of, of a process, of a process of logic and tact. And they do so in a way that goes undiscovered for some time. It might be a generation, it might be five. Shit, it might be mine. But when it's discovered, it's usually a pretty violent snapback. So, the impact on organizations is that they cannot provide a boss, but rather a coach. Should not provide a point-in-time annual review, but an ongoing review about performance, and can't just critique, but really need to develop strengths. This all sounds a little Pollyanna-ish. It's not meant to be. There is real accountability in everything written here, but these attributes are necessary to attract and retain the attention of talent. What does Pollyanna-ish mean? Pollyanna-ish. Someone who is unfailingly cheerful, no matter what, can be described as Pollyanna-ish. Pollyanna? Who is Pollyanna? It's probably a cartoon character. Pollyanna is a 1913 novel by American author Eleanor H. Porter, considered a classic of children's literature. The book's success led to Porter's soon writing a sequel, Pollyanna Grows Up. Eleven more Pollyanna sequels? God damn. Okay. All right. It's a person characterized by irrepressible optimism and a tendency to find good in everything. I guess it's not a bad thing to be. But, I mean, that, what, what, what a funny way to describe somebody. They got to be classified as fictional. <laughs> like somebody can't be uh, optimistic or, or cheerful always. I mean, it, it, it's possible. It's possible. But then it takes a lot of training, a lot of practice to view things in, a, in an optimistic light and not be, not be influenced by the emotions of others not be so readily influenced by the emotions of others. So, if this all sounds a little Pollyanna-ish, it's not meant to be. There is real accountability in everything written here, but these attributes are necessary to attract and retain the attention of talent. The attention of talent is purposeful phrasing because it is not just employment anymore. In the gig economy, employers need to retain the full attention of employees. 
Prior to the pandemic, it is estimated that 36% of Americans were engaging in gigs, whether these were their primary role or not. We often hear the phrase, there is no loyalty today. That's an easy quip to use, but what came first? The employee's departure or the organizational pullback in incentives? <laughs> That's pretty funny, chicken or the egg. Well, arguably, organizations changed behavior first. With decreases in pensions, then a decrease in 401k contributions, then a move to high deductible insurance, and changes in other benefits, the burden for self-care and long-term self-reliance continues to shift more and more to the employee. What is the incentive for loyalty? There is no incentive for loyalty. That's why you gotta move like a corporate fucking cowboy, an independent contractor, a gunner for money, a gunner for money, a gunner for fucking money. You wanna create value. You want to make money, not take money. Make it. So in that sense, you have to learn to negotiate for yourself because value is created within yourself. Value ain't just given to you and just applied and just, and just added. Value added is a fiction in business. It's created. Value is created and it's realized. It's actualized. It's not just pinned on something and arbitrarily it becomes it. It's not the case. We think, we think there is something that attachments can offer as a bridge for organizations to create loyalty and support employees the way they need to be supported. With so many generations in the workforce at the same time, we know that there is likely to be generational and work-life blurring. Let's take a 50-year-old man who is working in your average Fortune 50 professional services organization. He is well-educated with a living father and two children who have both recently finished college. In his role at work, it is possible he may observe employees who start to look like his children and superiors who look like his father. It is hard enough for him to manage the stress of balancing the multiple roles at work and at home. Now, he must think about balancing his emotional barriers to treat these groups differently. Could he slip and treat an employee with the same candor he might one of her children? Can't, could he could he slip? Okay, all right. No, let, let me just rant for a little bit right here because this is the fucking problem. This is the fucking problem with uh, with with uh, I don't know gender studies, gender studies, and just social justice, uh, so social justice missions in fucking academia. This sentence right here is the epitome of, what, of what's fucking wrong. Yes, I've seen this. I've seen this in in textbooks, academic journals, from undergrad through law school. This right here, this question, it says, could he slip and treat an employee with the same candor he might one of her children? So they fuck up the gender. They fuck it up. When they could have just gone gender neutral the whole fucking time. If they want to be, if they wanted to be so inclusive, go gender neutral the whole time. I'm not tooting my own horn, but... When I first got into the game, it was gender neutral all the fucking way. Why is it is there's a slew of benefits with just using they and them? Shit, I would rather they refer to me as they and them. So when they refer to Alex and they say they, they say them, I rep it's it, it is it is as if I represent a group. It is it's as if I'm coming with a fucking roster of hitters. Oh yeah, you know Alex? Yeah. They get down. <laughs> so Alex and their group gets fucking down, right? But nah, motherfuckers want to be sweet. Look at this. Could he slip and treat an employee with the same candor he might treat one of her children? Get the fuck out of here. Could he lose patience with his father and bring that to a superior at work? Of course, no one could fault him because... As we learned in chapter two, the intuitive brain is seeking analogs or mental models to make our life easier. Sometimes these emotions can be misaligned to the people and situations around us. Organizations can help in this process by rethinking developmental paths for people at different points of their career. First, organizations can create 
roles that simply reduce stress and the level of engagement for those being squeezed by parenthood and parents at the same time. This is a practical matter. Second, there can be a conscious decoupling of the emotional tracks that are likely to lead to unhealthy analogs such as parent-child mentorship relationships. Another way of discovering these challenges is through something like the Attachment Styles Index with the LMX. That's in Chapter 8, by the way, if you're interested. Go look at Part 9 of the audiobook. Get acquainted with the Attachment Styles Index with the LMX, where leaders can identify how to best align with followers. Third, there is a need to continue to educate workers on their emotional needs in the workplace and how to develop emotional awareness. Often branded as wellness groups, as well, not wellness groups, often branded as wellness programs, these solutions provide a better connection between employees and the intuitive brain that makes them more creative thinkers, more efficient employees, and more effective leaders. COVID and the workplace of the future. The global impact of COVID-19 is still stunning. I think what's still stunning is, you know, the manipulation of statistics, but the entire situation has created uncertainty, confusion, and loss. Yeah, my, my comment stands. Many struggle with health issues and the unimaginable loss of loved ones. Others have suffered the loss of their previously secure workplace swiftly disappearing into thin air. Over 48 million American workers were suddenly forced to work from home, and these were the lucky ones. All these situations created a sense of loss. At the time this book is being finished, it is an open question whether the post-pandemic workplace will quote-unquote return to normal. Most articles suggest it will not, and they are probably right. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, only 7% of workers in the United States had a flexible workplace benefit or telework. 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 However, the trend toward remote work was on the rise with the remote workforce growing by 159% between 2005 and 2017. During the height of the pandemic, a staggering 42% of the total U.S. workforce was working from home full-time. Many workers asked to maintain the role of remote worker in a post-pandemic period. Many employers looking to reduce their facility footprint would be content to oblige. The question we pose is, what is the organizational implication of such a decision? First, there is the challenge of culture. Whether it is culture creation, acculturation, or culture maintenance, there is no doubt that it is harder to build and sustain a culture in a remote setting. As we noted previously, culture is the unseen, not the visible. So building that unseen behavior can be even harder when it cannot be casually observed. Additionally, we have emphasized the importance of emotion and memory. Despite some wonderful efforts, memories developed on screen are simply not the same as memories developed in person. The shared emotion is not the same and it leads to culture and behavior being stored differently by our brains. A memory is a combination of the full sensory experience held together. That's time, place, people, sight, sound, smell, and conversation. If many of these elements are the same as in out as in your home, except what? If many of these elements are the same as in your home, except for the person's face on screen and the conversation, how do you create the same kind of shared memory? How do you create an organizational culture? Second, there is the issue of teaching new employees. While many current employees adapted well during the pandemic, many, not all, organizational thinking about a long-term remote workforce will need to solve for onboarding remotely. I think that's a fucking piece of cake, especially, I mean, and, and I'm a millennial, you feel me? And it wasn't that hard for me at all to transition from working at home to working in person to working at home to working in person. It could be because the way I'm wired, I'm just wired differently. 
and that for some people, I don't know, they say that the pandemic ruined their social skills. I mean, unless, unless you are one of those people, one of those people who did nothing else except fucking watch Netflix and beat it to por- fucking to, to, to porn, right? Or eat junk food and just become a fucking recluse, a hermit, a beached whale in your in your uh, at your place. I don't see why you wouldn't be working on developing yourself professionally. Would you think the pandemic was gonna last forever? Even if the pandemic lasted forever and we were in the fucking apocalypse, you still need social skills. You still have to conduct yourself professionally. What are you just gonna come out from your fucking cave, uh, a, a rundown, raggedy looking bitch? You'd get taken. First step, you come out the door, man, looking soft as fuck, get scooped up by wolves. Um, I don't know why, why, why I was ranting. <laughs> Second, there is the issue of teaching new employees. While many current employees adapted well during the pandemic, many, not all, that's true, organizational thinking about a long-term remote workforce will need to solve for onboarding remotely. This is a different challenge. A lot of independent, I don't know, just another, another side commentary, a lot of independent contractors already work remotely. You feel me? We're a different breed, a different breed, because we're not being onboarded, right? Granted, we're not employees either, but we just know how to move from organization to organization. And we do that from person to person by having that social skill set to be able to build, to be able to, to, to introduce ourselves and start building rapport immediately and cultivate that trust between person to person. So this is a different challenge. This is a different challenge. Much of our service and knowledge economy depends on learning through an apprenticeship model that is not easy to replicate remotely. In fact, it may be impossible to replicate remotely. Casual questions get lost. There is no water cooler and there is no learning by osmosis that happens from the casually overheard conversation. That sounds like a fucking boomer wrote this paragraph right here. It's sounding really fucking depressing. The, The absence of learning that happens in a shared space will be a challenge for many to overcome. Sure. Third, there is the issue of work-life balance. We still do not know which way this balance goes in the post-COVID world. Some have suggested that productivity increased for those working from home during the pandemic. Others have said they felt more stress at home. Some said they were able to have more balance. The truth is we just don't know yet how this impacts us, but we do know from attachment studies that there is an important transition period in all things and that working from home does remove that transition period between two important parts of our life. What many people dismiss as the commute is a downtime to separate work from the rest of life. And for many people, it is necessary to stop thinking about their work and be ready to engage with the rest of their life. What happens when the rest of their life is one room or just 10 feet away? Many articles agree that the most likely workplace of the future will be a hybrid work environment. This will lead to more time at home for those who want it with available workspace for those seeking the space. Given what we have discussed in this book about attachment styles, we know some will seek the space based on their need for social attachments. Given what we have written about culture, certain organizations will breed a desirable space for people to come and work. Given what we know about attachment in general, we believe that most will learn more effectively in person. But all of this will have to play out over the next few years or decades as we all form new ways of working and learning together in our new, less formal normal. COVID, sorry, no, this next section is battling burnout. COVID also exacerbated, exacerbated, exacerbated. COVID also exacerbated an organizational challenge that was already brewing burnout 
In 2003, the National Library of Medicine indexed 307 articles with the term burnout, which grew to, six, to 560 articles in 2009 and 2,137 articles in 2019. In 2019, the World Health Organization classified burnout as a disease, and in 2022, will refer to burnout as an occupational syndrome. Even prior to the pandemic, some of the worst symptoms of burnout were in the healthcare industry, where long shifts were the norm for upcoming residents. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen Trezak, Trezak, Trezak. Stephen Trezak found that burnout among doctors not only leads to a decline in good decision making, but a decline in compassion for patients. Yeah, I mean, I can tell you that. Moreover, there is a real financial cost to burnout. I could right now, I could tell you the solution to burnout right now, but um, you ain't gonna like it. It's gonna sound rather socialistic. So I'd rather you become a fucking corporate cowboy and negotiate for a fair share of that financial cost instead of saying, "Oh, the entire financial cost of burnout ought to be redistributed." The fuck out of here. As employees struggle, they disengage, which leads to a reduction in value for their salary of an average of 34%. Furthermore, as many as half of these employees will attrite, which has an additional cost in replacement of labor. There is also the health care cost, which is estimated between $125 and $190 billion a year in the United States alone. COVID made this all worse. According to a KPMG survey of CIOs, 84% of leaders within organizations reported they were concerned with the mental health of their team due to the circumstances of the pandemic. With good reason. During the pandemic, 89% of respondents to one survey noted their work life was getting worse, and 85% said their well-being had declined. So, what's to be done? Victoria has been working with DHG healthcare people and change team to focus research and attention on this issue in the workplace. Over the last year, they have published a series of articles to shed, to shed some light on the challenges of burnout in the healthcare industry and beyond. The first step is to acknowledge burnout is an organizational issue. Despite the WHO declaration, many organizational leaders still view burnout as a personal problem. Yet, nothing could be further from the truth. As we have seen throughout our discussions in this book, organizations intentionally build attachments with their employees via culture, training, communications, and employee agreements. We have also seen that the employment relationship is a relationship between the organization, the leader, and the employee. The organization must take its part in the relationship. Research identifies six main causes of burnout. An unsustainable workload. A perceived lack of control. Insufficient rewards for effort. Lack of a supportive community. Lack of fairness mismatched values and skills of these six areas all of them have an opportunity for organizational systems to support employees please note the language is opportunity not obligation second organizations need to dig into their data to understand the challenges of their own people broad perspectives on the economy may not apply to every organization it is critical that leaders understand what is happening in the organization for their people. A survey on burnout is also an excellent opportunity to explore some of the other underlying relationships in the organization, such as the attachment styles index, change diagnostic index, or the culture study. The most important may be understanding the leader follower relationships with the attachment styles index. Often, direct supervisor behavior, or simply a disconnect with an employee, can be an unintended consequence of organizational systems. Third, 
build a roadmap to quote unquote bend the curve. I thought I thought we were trying to flatten the curve. Fifteen days to fucking assuming that the organ <laughs> dude somebody's gonna hear this bullshit in fucking twenty twenty nine or twenty forty or twenty forty nine fucking twenty ninety and be like well what the fuck what does flatten the curve mean it's probably some gay ass inside joke assuming that the organization is like all others facing the burnout challenge today then there is an opportunity to develop tangible next steps to support people through their burnout just like other cha- just like other changes the plan would include active retraining of the intuitive brain to drive new behavior through effective communications possibly some experiential training and strong performance management to test progress against stated behavioral change through these steps an organization can build the right path to battling burnout Discussing diversity, the last few years have not just been challenging due to COVID. They also included the racial tension of the United. The last few years, uh, the last few years have not just been challenging due to COVID. They also included the racial tension of the United States and globally, globally sparked by the murder of George Floyd. Global influence, my guy, dude. Have have y'all seen the videos? He's got on the hub. He got a neat looking chest tattoo. I mean, but I could I could say that and also say that this this poor training, poor training on the part of uh, what the fuck? What the fuck is his name? Those was it Milwaukee even? Those Milwaukee officers. Anyways, I mean all that. The fuck, fuckery, fuckery is uh, non non exclusive. I mean, yeah, I'll just put it that way. Fuckery is non exclusive. The conversation. Oh, the Black Lives Matter movement has again moved to the ever present challenge of race in America to the foreground of conversation. They should they should move into a more what's it called? cost of living neighborhood i don't know y'all should research the properties owned by black lives matter or the founders the conversation the protests and the tension with police created a necessary reckoning in many businesses about their own diversity and inclusion policies but i mean if you want to learn about about philanthropy philanthropy go go watch that go listen to that episode that episode i believe is in season three Season three, that's the overall fuckery of nonprofit organizations. Of of what nonprofit organizations have been have been reduced to. And that's just because of money hungry people, un unscrupulous people who have no morals, who have no sense of direction, who don't operate by logic and tact, and just just aren't professional. A confident professional would be out gunning for them. The conversation, the protest, and the tension with police created, with po- with police. The, oh, the conversation, the protest, and the tension, and the tension with police created a necessary reckoning in many businesses about their own diversity and inclusion policies. Oh, okay, about their own diversity and inclusion policies. I thought just a reckoning in many businesses, given the the mostly peaceful protest. <laughs> But actually, it's true as far as policy and inclusion goes, because a lot of the, a lot of many businesses had to resort to posting up signs like, "Please don't," um, yeah, no, please don't burn down my shit because you know this is black owned or this is minority owned. I, I can't believe they had to resort to that. I mean, given that it was mostly peaceful, they really had to put signs up. Something ain't adding up. Why would they put signs up if it was quote unquote mostly peaceful? Many organizations opted to go beyond the stance of a diverse workforce toward an anti-racist society. Ooh. The decision to support Black Lives Matter to become an anti-racist organization, ooh, or to support a host of other social activist policies requires its own organizational reckoning. Dude, why is it? And you'll find this now. If you're listening to this and you're younger, you'll find this coming up through undergrad, coming up through graduate school. The last chapter, the last chapter of a lot of these academic texts, 
this is fucking bullshit. <laughs> it literally just serves to 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 confirm and validate and legitimize the fuckery that's taking place in society. And they're not offering. They're not as far as this chapter goes. They're not offering any real solutions. They aren't. They're just saying that uh, th these are. They're probably going to say, oh, these attachment styles also uh, have have an impact as far as uh, race and, and socioeconomic status. And, 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 and those can't be changed but have to be addressed. I mean, come on, bro. Like, that, that's cabining people. That, that's cabining individuals into into tiers, into classes, into echelons, and essentially saying that it, they, they can only move... Uh, as far as their echelon, as their echelon ranges, as far as their their tier or their class allows, <laughs> that's like cementing the idea of classes without actually saying it. That's I don't know. I mean, some some folks want to be the victim, some folks want to play the victim, and then you got uh, huck. What's it called? Hucksters? Is it a huckster? Is it is it a huckster I'm thinking of? What's a what is a huckster definition? Definition of huck huckster. A huckster. A huckster is anyone who sells something or serves biased interests using pushy or showy tactics. Historically, this term meant any type of peddler or vendor, but over time it has assumed pejorative connotations. Fuck yeah, it's pejorative, and I meant that in the most pejorative way possible. You got hucksters out here, slanging race, slanging race and socioeconomic status. Why? Because that shit sells better than sex nowadays. The only thing that sells better, it's just too high priced and taboo is violence. But, you know, I'm not gonna go there. Wilkins discovered a powerful link. Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. Um, the decision to support Black Lives Matter. We have been working with Thies, Thais Wilkins to explore the connection between these corporate decisions on the Black Lives Matter movement and attachment. Wilkins discovered a powerful link between the two. Oh, tell us more, Wilkins. She noticed that often employees believe a new conversation around race is akin to breaking the psychological contract we discussed in Chapter 5. That's Part 6 of the audiobook. Go look at it. Go read it. However, this may be a necessary break to advance the organization toward new social objectives the leadership wants to pursue. The leadership. The leadership wants to pursue. Even if it's not... Uh, conducive socially to the organization at large or to society if the leadership quote unquote parentheses parentheses leadership wants to pursue <laughs> however you want to frame that right because it could be uh, a leadership with triple crosses around it a leadership with triple moons and stars around it first we know that this guy they're just unprofessional fucks they're 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 subverting the organization that they're "Quote unquote," leading for their own benefit, for their own—I don't know—moral virtuehood, for their own moral victimhood. First, we know for their own sense of being a hero, when really they're just like fucking Ralph from The Simpsons. I'm helping, fucking bitches. First, we know that discussions of race elicit emotional responses. As a result. Many organizations avoid the conversation altogether. However, I mean, honestly, I think that's the best. If they avoid the conversation, the conversation altogether, that's fine. I mean, if we're just talking about race relations, racial, racial conflict, I think if, if, you, if someone was literally colorblind, they'd have no reason to actually talk about it. But I mean, motherfuckers want to be not colorblind, so they have something to talk about. So they have victims and oppressors to talk about so so they have something to fucking talk about at the water cooler so they have fucking drama to spread at work i'm not i'm not bestowing i'm not bestowing the gossip label to any particular demographic i'm just saying 
as a result, many organizations avoid the conversation altogether. However, we also know that this emotional response means the reaction resides in the limbic system and is part of the intuitive brain. That means we are likely dealing with an attachment. An attachment to race? Get the fuck. All right. I mean, yeah, personally, maybe, but organizationally, we, we fucking professionals, homie. And if you have something to say that is the denigrative to my associates, you fucking with all of us, man. That's it. Straight up. I'm colorblind. The only color I see is gray and green. Gray and green. I mean, as far as U.S. currency goes, it's still technically green. But other than that, it's just grayscale, baby. It's just grayscale. All I see is, is tools and implements. Implements, tools, and utility. That means we are likely dealing with an attachment. Organizations need to welcome the conversation. Second, organizations need to consider... You see, now, now they're, not, they're not even offering suggestions. They're fucking offering... They're, they're demanding. Dollar says that, that the authors of this book posted up black squares in June of 2020. Second, organizations need to consider bringing in external facilitators to drive the organizational conversations on race. These conversations require psychological safety and expertise with the subject matter. One wrong move can cause the conversation to go sideways. Worse than that, what... One wrong move from an org, from an executive, worse than that, one wrong move from an executive could cause others to lose respect for the entire process. Uh, yeah. Especially if they're if it's an organization full of baby back bitches. Spineless, spineless baby back bitches. Third, since we know this topic hits on attachments, we need to dig deeper to dig past the initial layer of attachments and mental models to an additional layer of layer of mentals models it says your mentals mental models where common ground can be found Ooh, perhaps the next level is an attachment to the organization perhaps it is an attachment to a religion or the nation okay fourth or <laughs> okay fourth organizations need to support helping some individuals who have the right to connective stories to become allies of the racial equality movement yeah, organizations need to do that. Okay. These changes, these change agents can become transitional objects in the process of supporting change within the organization. A business may even consider training individuals to develop a well-rounded story that will resonate with more people across the organization. Last, companies need to be intentional about how to position their mission towards social issues. Each organization can find meaningful ways to authentically support social objectives, but the key is to have authentic alignment of social and financial objectives. A business that lacks the right social aims for their lines of business will likely suffer criticism and reputational issues in the market. What does it all mean? We're stuck, but we don't have to be. The purpose of this book was to bring together the lessons of research on the brain and attachment to help you understand how you can help yourself as an individual and leader and your organization. To that end, here are the top five lessons we think you should take away from this book for individuals, for leaders, and for organizations. Top five takeaways for individuals. Okay. One, create, it says your I, it's in the first person, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna, fuck it, I'll read it if you want to. I'll read it. I create attachments through memory, learning, and emotion. These are good and help me connect to the people and places around me. That's in chapters two and three. For those, you go listen to parts three and four. Parts three and four. Number two, when I lose something, whether it's tangible or abstract, it may cause a sense of loss. That is okay and normal. The important thing is how I regulate myself through that experience. That's in chapter three. For that, you want to go listen to part four of this audiobook. Number three here says, I have an attachment style that is based on the unique experiences of my life. This likely informs who I am, how I interact with others, how I interact with my work environment, and how I respond to the sense of loss. That's in chapter four. For those for that, you want to go listen to the audiobook part 
five. Number four here says, certain objects help me through this sense of loss. I want to identify the right objects for me so that I can feel more comfortable with the transition and move through the situation securely. And this is found in chapter five. You want to go listen to the audiobook part six for that. Number five here says, during times of change, all these feelings become more intense. Even small changes may feel, no, even small changes make, make me feel, may make me feel like I am losing something big. I need to identify what I may be losing, understand my emotions, and identify the objects. That's people, places, or ideas that will help me through the change. That is in chapter seven. And you'll find that in the audiobook part eight. Here are five key takeaways for leaders. When I lose something, whether it's tangible or abstract, it may cause a sense of loss. That is okay and normal. The important thing is, the important thing is how I regulate myself through that experience and how well I demonstrate that regulation to others. These are in chapters three and eight. You want to go listen to part four and part nine, respectively. Number two here says, I have an attachment style that is based on the unique experiences of my life and it may not resonate with my followers. I need to consider how to manage my attachment style based on my followers and the situation we face. That's chapters four and eight. Go listen to parts five and nine for that. Number three here says, I need to connect with my own emotions to help my team connect with their emotions. This will help me construct shared experiences for my team and build the right visuals or stories to communicate how we will collectively address challenges as a group. That's in chapter eight. Go listen to part nine for this. I need to develop transitional objects when we are going through a change that will help our team move from the current state to a future state and acknowledge I might not be one of them. You'll find that in chapters five and chapters eight. Go listen to, uh, go listen to part six and part nine. I need to set the stage with the connection to our mission, then encourage different types of communication, that's visual and verbal, different types of collaboration, that's virtual and in-person, different types of co-creation, that's playful and formal, and diverse thinking to speak to our broad workforce and the challenges ahead. You'll find those in chapters seven, eight, and nine. So in the audiobook, that'll be parts eight, nine, and 10, respectively. Five key takeaways for organizations. Leverage unique assessments that account for the lessons of attachment, including the attachment styles index, the change diagnostic index and the culture study. Those are in chapters five, seven, sorry. Those are in chapters four, six, and seven. In the audio book, those are gonna be five, seven, and eight. Number two here says, build a culture that connects employees to a purpose and allows them to build their own attachments to the organization while supporting the overall mission of the organization. You'll find this material in chapters six and seven. Those are parts seven and eight of the audiobook. Number three says, develop leaders that understand the importance of attachment among their team members, can identify their own attachment style, and can communicate their own role during a change. These are found in chapters four, six, seven, and eight. So the audiobook, you'll want to go to chap, uh, part five, part seven, part eight, and part nine. Number four here says, plan for change by building the capability to change. Rethink training, communications, and performance management, and aligning transitional objects to support your people through the many changes ahead. This is in chapter eight. For that, you wanna to go to part nine of the audiobook. Number five here says, own the future by organizing around the way the brain works now to account for shifts in demographics, expectations, and economic trends that will change the workplace tomorrow. These are in chapters eight and nine. So we want to listen to audiobook part nine and 10. 
attachment behavior is an instinctual response that begins in our earliest days of life and impacts how we connect and interact with the world around us. Attachment can be positive. It can create strong cohesion among workers, help build a productive culture, and make people excited to come to work. When those objects are taken away or are no longer available, then people can feel a real and acute sense of loss. This loss can profoundly impact the ability of the individuals to complete daily work tasks and impact the productivity of organizations. Understanding attachment is a powerful tool for leaders in organizations. It can help us create the right kind of work environment for our employees, create an effective culture, and create a stickiness within the organization. We do this with a combination of memory, emotions, and learning via the brain that combines with the positive experiences our employees have from the past. The trick is to create a stickiness without letting employees get stuck. We know the only certainty is that we will change some aspect of the organization they have come to appreciate. We are all on a journey, whether it is a new strategy, a new leader, a new process, or new technology. Something will cause a shift in the workplace that will make us change, and when it happens, we need to take the time to remember that we help the brain attach to the previous strategy, leader, process, or technology, and now we need to help undo it. We need to help it become unstuck. We also need to remember that on this journey is our human brain that developed just a few thousand years ago. Unlike our advances in technology, it does not develop on Moore's law. The brain evolves more slowly, more generationally, perhaps even glacially. We must remember that on this journey, our society is the hare blasting forward, but our brain is the tortoise still plodding along. We may want to run with the hare, but when leading organizations, we move with the tortoise. Our leaders, our people, and our brains are all necessary for the journey. Are we ready or are we likely to get stuck? And now for some practical exercises. The first one here is to collect, connecting with technology. As we discussed above, technology can have a very strong role in supporting connectivity and it can have a role in creating silos. Too often as new technologies are deployed, People feel the disconnection before the connection. The purpose of this exercise is to find the connection in the technology. This exercise can easily be done as a group exercise. Damn, and this sounds like a pretty good exercise too. Why do they have to stick the best exercise after some, some fucking retarded ass social justice message? Don't get me wrong, I'm for social justice. But the fucking messaging, the marketing, the promotion, Fucking uh, literally retarding society. It's literally retarding progress. But I guess that's another episode. Think of a tech. Number one here says the first step is think of a technology in the organization. Number two, describe slash write down the purpose of the technology. You can write these down, by the way. That's why I slowed down my reading so you can write these down. Number three, write slash describe how the organization would complete the same purpose without the technology. I'll repeat that again because I messed it up. Now describe slash write down how the organization would complete the same purpose without the technology. Number four, think about the following questions. First bullet here is would there be more or less communication without the technology? Sub bullet says, if more, why? Another sub bullet says, if less, why? Second point here, would more communication be a good thing for this process or a bad thing? A sub point says, if good, how could the current technology increase communication? If bad, how could the current technology decrease communication? The third bullet point here says, does the technology make you do more work than you would have to do without it? The sub point says, if yes, is there a logical reason for this? 
another sub point says if no good another bullet says do you remember how this technology was introduced to you sub point to that says how did you feel about it at the time another sub point says how do you feel about it now now a sub question to that is if it changed at all what caused it to change meaning your feelings if your feelings changed at all what caused it to change and another uh, sub point to that one is if it is the same what might cause it to change next we reflect loss in the time of COVID-19 COVID-19 has been a difficult time for many people around the world we sincerely hope that there that no one experienced a loss of loved ones I'm reading through this fast because this one doesn't seem I mean it's still a sense of loss but I'm just reading through it fast to get through it we sincerely hope that no one experienced the loss of loved ones during this period or personally struggled with the disease we also hope that no one struggled with any of the difficulty of depression that many people felt during this time there are there were undoubtedly some lesser losses that you felt daily that impacted your life and your work the purpose of this exercise is to think about those areas and think about how they impacted each other number one list out some of the changes in your life due to COVID-19 number two circle the changes that you would think sort of as losses number three look at the things you did not circle should you rewrite them to sound more like losses <laughs> do you want to sound more like a victim <laughs> number four label the losses as either work or life okay number five look at the list take the top three work losses and list them on the right hand side of the page list the top three life losses on the left hand side of the page number seven damn i'm just i'm not even numbering them off anymore number four label the losses as either work or life number five looking at the list take the top three work losses and list them on the right hand side of the page number six list the top three life losses on the left hand side of the page of the same page number seven answer the following questions first question are the losses related second is there any way that the work losses support the life losses three do the life losses help the work losses four is there any sort of transitional object you think you created for yourself during this period if so what did you create it just for yourself or others too number eight big eight write the transitional objects between the two lists of work losses and life losses could you use this transitional object again number nine as you think about the post-pandemic world what things will change back on this list what will stay the same ten most importantly what do you have control of to change back the way you want and what will remain the same based on the decisions of your organization or others in your life next exercise next exercise is to reflect and apply a burnout assessment according to Christina Maslach of the University of California Berkeley Susan E Jackson Rogers of Rutgers and Michael Leiter of Deakin University burnout has six main causes as we mentioned above these causes have an opportunity for organizations to build systems to support employees feeling burnt out first point here is when you think about your own work situation do you think you are burning out the sub question to that is if so which of the following causes is contributing to your burnout if not which of the following causes is likely to cause you to burn out in your organization circle the cause or causes or likely cause or causes below and it's a list a list of three six six causes unsustainable workload perceived lack of control so unsustainable workload perceived lack of control lack of control insufficient rewards for effort lack of supportive community lack of fairness mismatched values and skills as we learned in chapter 8 leadership can have a lot to do with the direct feelings of an employee 
when you think about your feelings, do you think about the ch- when you think about your feelings, do you think about the cause? I'm just reading that. Maybe I'm getting tired. When you think about your feelings, do you think that the cause is a result of your work situation, your supervisor, or a result of the organizational systems in place? Table 9.1 provides an opportunity for you to fill and track which applies to you. Put an X in the box for the possible sources. So here's table 9.1. Like I do in every episode, I will describe the table to you so that you might be able to reproduce it by writing it down on a piece of paper. Or I guess, I suppose you can envision it in your mind if you're really good at um, imagine, what is it? Imaginary projection. The table is called the burnout self-assessment and is necessarily uh, not a not a matrix, but a table of sorts with the top row listing uh, three instances where it's your situation, your supervisor behavior, and your organizational systems. On the left-hand column, it's those six causes of burnout. They go pretty much in order that they were listed before from top to bottom. And the objective here is to assess, to evaluate whether any one of those six apply and any one of the three listed contexts of your situation, of your particular situation, supervisor behavior, and organizational studies. So uh, the first one is unsustainable workload. I'll go through them in order. Unsustainable workload, I want to put an X, whether it pertains to your situation, supervisor behavior, organizational systems. The next is perceived lack of control. Decide if it applies in your situation as to supervisor behavior or organizational systems. Insufficient rewards for effort, whether it's in your situation, supervisor behavior, organizational systems. A lack of a supportive community in your situation, supervisor behavior, organizational systems. Lack of fairness in your situation or from supervisor behavior or from organizational systems or mismatched values and skills, given your situation, given supervisor behavior and organizational systems. Now, thinking about how to solve the challenges of burnout for you, do you think the solution for your cause will come from a change in your situation, your supervisor's behavior or organizational systems? Put a check mark in the box that applies, whether or not uh, a change in any one of those three categories will impact or make a change in any one of those six causes you want to put a check mark as opposed to an x and then lastly what would be that possible solution how feasible is that what would need to happen for that solution to be realized damn that's open-ended as fuck but ultimately it's it, it could be boiled down to the development of the person's, the individual's professional capacity, professional capacity, making consummate professionals of everyone on some corporate cowboy shit. Okay, lastly, apply as it's applying. That's the exercise. Building new psychological contracts. Your organization may need to break existing psychological contracts to develop new approaches to diversity or social issues. Okay. It is important to identify the existing psychological contract and what is fundamentally changing in the organization for the employees, if anything, to write the new psychological contract. Table 9.2 is a template for this process. It is important to note that during the process, it is possible that employees may find very little's says your littles is changing for most people. Very little is changing for most people. There, I can't believe, I mean, I, I suppose I could, I could believe it, but I mean, as far as like editing and, and revising goes for this, man, I hope the next edition fucking eliminates the last chapter almost completely, except for the exercises, except for the exercises and takeaways. <clears throat> but um, littles, I can't believe like a fucking blue or red squiggly didn't appear under that. 
I can't believe it wasn't under underlined for revision for <laughs> for for you know for in whatever word processor is being used it is an important note it is important to note that during the process it is possible that employees may find very little is changing for most people there could be a vocal minority that is clinging to a mythological past that is no longer present in the organization. This exercise can highlight that difference among employees. In Table 9.2, Table 9.2's titles is Building a New Psychological Contract. In the top row, the top row, it lists old contract and new contract in two columns. You're creating two columns there on the right-hand side. The left-hand side that column is for, um, I guess, new clauses, new clauses to this new contract. I, I believe that's the best way I can describe it. And they are listed in this column. In order to use this table, you want to identify what is in the old contract as far as these clauses and then modify them or amend them. Or maybe you want to keep them the same. For this new contract to be created so for example and I'll start listing them off here the first one here states the primary role of employees is to dot 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 there's an, uh, an ellipsis that follows there so the primary role of employees is to and then you want to go to the old contract uh, uh, column there and you want to write there what was the primary role of employees given the old contract then you want to, I suppose, you want to pause briefly and think about what the new contract will contain. Move over to the new contract side and jot down a couple of ideas. Second, the primary role of managers is to dot dot dot. So go ahead and fill out what the primary role of managers was given the old contract. Think about what the new contract will contain and fill that in as well. Employees who perform well will dot dot dot. That's the third one. Employees who perform well will, and then under the old contract, what will, you know, new uh, employees who perform well, what, what, what of them under the old contract and then under the new contract? Employees who do not perform well will, and then under the old contract, what will they do? What will be a, become of them? And then also in the new contract. The next one is the primary source of development is under the old contract, I suppose was. And then under the new contract, think about what the primary source of development will be. And then the last one here is employees are expected to stay for under the new contract. What were they expected to stay for? And then you want to think about under the new contract, what will they be expected to stay for? What will employees be expect, expected to stay for? And that concludes this, these exercises in Chapter 9 of Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. That is the end of the book, Stuck, How to Win at Work by Understanding Loss. The authors were Victoria Grady and Patrick McCreesh. Publishers was Productivity Press 2022. Narrated by yours truly, Alex, a corporate cowboy, powered by Incorporating Associates. And this mission is always not for profit. So if you would like to contribute, maybe hear another audiobook or two. And it won't be uh, exclusively um, on the podcast. It may be on the Patreon. You can subscribe to the Patreon and listen to more audiobooks. Uh, you can find us by the Corporate Cowboy Podcast. On Patreon, there are multiple tiers to subscribe to for a monthly donation, keeping the operation free. Any and all funds be at the Patreon. There is a PayPal, there is a Cash App, there is a Venmo, there is a link, a link tree that you can find those links at. Any donations that come in will go to business expenses and legal fees in order to keep this operation not for profit. And uh, as we form our own legal entities and get the ball rolling to be able to provide uh, tax uh, tax deductions for those generous donors and you know, also do some other 
nonprofit work, let's call it, for the sake of for the sake of understanding loss. <laughs> for the sake of winning at work by understanding loss. You know, you can read between the lines. But until then, until next time, have yourselves a great rest of your day, your morning, your afternoon, your night, your week, your year. Take care.